Welcome, everyone. I think we will get started. I'm sorry we could not meet in person, but we're fortunate to have this technology so that this crucial and timely topic can be explored. Our two guests tonight will discuss international legal perspectives on the environmental dimensions of the war in Ukraine. They'll pro provide examples from the current war that offer a snapshot into the diverse environmental impacts of war and explore linkages to the climate crisis. They will also discuss the primary legal dimensions to be considered under international law. Um, Carl Brook is one of our speakers who is, he is the Director of International Programs at the Environmental Law Institute and founding president of the Environmental Peace Building Association. His work focuses on environmental peace building, especially after conflict, environmental governance, adaptation, and environmental emergencies. He has helped dozens of countries, including in many conflict affected areas throughout Africa, the Americas, Asia, and Europe, strengthen their environmental laws, institutions, and practices. Mm -hmm. he, um, he has edited more than 10 books and authored more than 80 journal articles, book chapters, and reports. He's an adjunct professor at American University School of International Service. He holds a JD from Northwestern School of Environmental Law of Lewis and Clark College, an MA in Physics from the University of Texas, Austin, and a BS in Physics with additional majors in Mathematics and Anthropology from Michigan State University. It's a lot to cover there. <laughs> um, he is one of the world's foremost experts in this area of environmental law. So we're very um, honored and privileged to have him here today. Our other speaker is Carol Moffitt. He is CEO and president of the Center for International Law. He is a recognized expert on international environmental law and a leader in the emerging fields of climate litigation and climate related financial legal risks. He is co-editor with Carl Brook and Sandra Nichols of Governance, National Resources and Post-Conflict Peacebuilding in 2016 for the Environmental Law Institute and the United Nations um, Environment Program. He served as lead author with Carl Brook and others on the 2022 Open Letter on the Environmental Dimensions of the Russian Invasion of Ukraine. He serves on the Board of Trustees for the Climate Accountability Institute and the Steering Committee for the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty and co-chairs the Legal Working Group of the Global Gas and Oil Network. So as you can see, we have two um, renowned experts here. We're very lucky to talk about this very important topic, which I felt we were covering a year of discussions on the war in Ukraine. This really had to be part of it. So I will hand it over to them. If you want more information about their organizations, you can check the Allworth website at www.allworth.org. So I will turn it over to our guests. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having us. And we, we really appreciate this opportunity to talk with all of you on, on, these, on these issues, both on the, on the foundations for them and the questions they raise for, for lawyers and, and for policy experts. Um, you know, as, as was mentioned, Carl and I joined more than 900 uh, experts from international law and peace building together with 156 human rights and peace building organizations from more than 75 countries in the days after Russia invaded Ukraine in February of, of, of last year. Um, and in that letter, we warned about the profound environmental dimensions of conflicts of this kind and the acute risks of, of the Russia's invasion in, in an area that is highly industrialized and peppered with not only, not only chemical facilities and oil and gas facilities, but also nuclear facilities, making the, the environmental risks of this invasion unique and um, potentially profound. At the same time, and as we'll cover tonight, um, while the risks are particularly severe in this, con con in this context and in this conflict, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is emblematic of the profound intersections we see around the world between conflict, environment, human health, and human rights 
both for, for current generations and for generations yet to come. In the immediate aftermath of, of its invasion in late February of 2022 or 2021, Russia moved quickly to capture the, the containment facility for the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine. Russia's, Russia's seizure of this facility raised profound risks. Obviously there was the risk and the threat, a threat that has you know, in many senses continued of the facility being used intentionally or unintentionally for, for nuclear terrorism or for nuclear, or, or nuclear material being mobilized and released um, as a result of the conflict. But even beyond that, one of, the, one of the things that is materialized in the wake of the occupation of the Chernobyl site was that radioactive dust from the Chernobyl site was mobilized and released on Russian soldiers who were moving through the site unprotected and uninformed about how to deal with the unique dangers of radioactive material. In the ensuing months, we've also seen <laughs> Forest fires erupting um, as a result of the conflict and as a result of the difficulty of managing fire in a conflict zone um, in, in and around Chernobyl in ways that have led to the remobilization of radioactive material. But Chernobyl isn't the only nuclear site at risk in, in Ukraine. Um, Russian forces also launched attacks on and ultimately took control of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in southern Ukraine. At one point early in the conflict, Zaporizhia was actually, parts of that facility were on fire and firefighting personnel could not reach the flames because they were in a live combat situation. I think um, as, as you see in this headline from PBS NewsHour just recently, um, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency says that a nuclear accident at that site remains entirely possible because it, is, it has lost, it has repeatedly lost access to the grid power that is necessary to keep reactors cool. The risks and the impacts within Ukraine have not by any means been limited to the nuclear risks profound as those are. As we mentioned at the beginning of our, our conversation, Eastern Ukraine is heavily industri industrialized and, and has a heavy concentration, not just of heavy industry generally, but of oil and gas refineries and chemical plants specifically. Um, as you may be aware, Russia and Ukraine alike are both major exporters, for example, of, of fertilizers that are based on, on ammonia and other, other chemicals. The strikes at these plants, whether intentional or unintentional, have repeatedly risks, have re repeatedly risked released chemicals into the Ukrainian environment, um, including into populated areas. Both through those impacts and through and, and through direct impacts on Ukraine's freshwater resources and water infrastructure, we see both human waste and chemical waste being released into Ukraine's water supplies with impacts both on human populations now and into the future and on, and on ecosystems and the environment. These, these releases are being compounded by chemical residues from ammunition and from missiles themselves. Uh, this is a fact that's long been known to experts in the environmental and conflict field, but rarely receives the attention it deserves, particularly during conflict. Those residues are having long-term effects on the soils, on the groundwater, on, you know, and on the safety of arable land where crops will be grown. The net effect is that we are seeing across Ukraine impacts on soil and water that will last not only years after the conflict subsides, but potentially decades or generations. And this brings with it enormous both human exposures 
and enormous long-term cleanup costs. The impacts of the war, however, have not been limited to, to human infrastructure, human lives, human health, or human rights. Um, every conflict brings enormous impacts to biodiversity, to ecosystems, to protected areas, and this is no exception. Indeed, indeed, Russia has launched active mili military operations in protected areas inside of Ukraine, um, including in the Black Sea National Wildlife Refuge and the Tuslo Lagoons um, National Nature Park, areas of particular biodiversity, biodiversity value for the country. And with those operations and Russia's expanded operations in the Black Sea, um, comes a mounting environmental and ecological toll. Um, just this month, two new studies out suggest that Russia's operations in the Black Sea and in the Tuzla Lagoons area have led to more than 50,000 Black Sea dolphins dying. Um, this is actually putting the, that population at increased risk of extinction. And animals are not the only uh, are not the only part of ecosystems that are impacted. One of the things that we have also seen that is emblematic of resource wars around the world is that Russia has been has launched massive industrial logging operations and industrial deforestation operations in the areas of Ukraine under its control, with as Ukrainian authorities have highlighted potentially long-term and catastrophic consequences for the Ukrainian environment. In order to seek compensation or seek accountability for those costs, ultimately it will be necessary to, uh, to tally them, to assess them. And here is, you know, what I want to note is we are in the early stages of those assessments being get being given. A recent analysis published in Politico put the estimated costs of the environmental damages from the war at 48 billion euros. I've seen a more recent analysis um, just in, in recent days that pushes that figure to over 100 billion when the impacts on forests and other, other resources are considered. Um, efforts to begin laying the groundwork for more, more robust assessments are ongoing. And in the meantime, environmental experts, conflict experts, Ukrainian activists and others are, are highlighting the incredible importance of maintaining a focus on the environmental dimensions of the war as the war continues and highlighting that ultimately, ultimately to, to remedy the impacts of the war, we need to consider its, its impacts on climate. We need to mainstream environmental protection and military doc, doctrine. Um, we need to develop mechanisms and structures, structures to ensure accountability for those who've caused damage to Ukraine's environment. And before we can get there, we need to identify, document, and assess environmental damage and its impacts to public health and ecosystems across the country. So this is, this is a foundation for what we are seeing in Ukraine. And with that, I'll turn it over to Carl, who can talk a little bit more about how this relates to what we've seen um, in conflicts worldwide. Why, Carl? Thank you, Carol. So um, as Carol noted, this is unfortunately not original. This is not the first time the environment has been targeted or otherwise harmed by uh, conflict. Um, in, there is a long history of intentionally targeting the environment. This goes back to the Punic Wars where Rome salted the, uh, the fields around Carthage after uh, they won. Um, it actually goes back even farther uh, if you look at some of the scholarship. Uh, we saw scorched earth tactics in World War II um, the uh, widespread clearance of foliage, uh, both through 
herbicides and through Operation Rome Plow during the Vietnam War. Um, the targeting of oil wells and the, uh, the Gulf in the 1990-91 war between Iraq and Kuwait. The 2007 conflict between Russia and Georgia, which led to widespread uh, forest fires, it, 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 it goes right up to the present. We, we also see the use of environment as a weapon. Um, going back to Babylon, there were efforts to redirect rivers. Uh, we saw in the Vietnam War efforts to change weather patterns in Southeast Asia to bog down the Viet Cong. And in uh, World War II and the Korean conflict, we saw uh, efforts uh, to uh, burst dams and release floods. And even as recently as um, the war in Afghanistan and in Iraq, uh, particularly Iraq, we saw concerns that the dams might be used to flood innocent areas. <coughs> We've seen uh, targeting of infrastructure with impacts on the environment, particularly pollution. Uh, some of the examples, the recent ones include Serbia, where Panchovo and Novi Sad, uh, which were industrial areas were targeted, power plant in Gia, Lebanon in 2009. Um, we've seen targeting of infrastructure used uh, that use environmental services and benefits, including notably water infrastructure in Ukraine, but also in Sudan, in Yemen, Palestine. Um, it takes very little technology to target water infrastructure. And we see a lot of use of natural resources to finance armed conflict. And a lot of this goes back to the end of the Cold War. Some of it predates the, uh, the, the end of the Cold War. We saw um, in Angola, for example, um, ivory and timber and diamonds being used in the 80s. But with the end of the Cold War, there was an end of financing for proxy wars. And so generally rebels looked around to see what they could, how they could generate revenues. And that has led to widespread exploitation in different ways of natural resources. Um, sometimes it's the extraction, sometimes it's the trade, sometimes it's simply putting up a roadblock and taxing, if you will, the movement of resources. And people are familiar with blood diamonds, blood timber, but we also see blood bananas coming out of Somalia, um, marble in Afghanistan, uh, rubies and sapphires, um, oka, cacao, any natural resource that provides a revenue stream, provides a revenue stream that rebels and others can use to finance armed conflict. So those are all essentially direct intentional impacts on the environment. We've also seen a wide scale range of incidental impacts where there isn't really a desire to harm the environment or to exploit the environment necessarily, it's just survival strategies. Um, refugees in IDP, that's internally displaced persons um, often uh, need to find water, they need to find fuel um, for cooking. And this was probably most notable following the 1994 Rwandan genocide, where about a million refugees uh, settled across the border in the De Democratic Republic of the Congo, then Zaire, right next to the only habitat for the, uh, in the world for upland mountain gorillas. And that just ate away at the habitat for the gorillas. It also was not a particularly good place, led to cholera epidemics. We see people just trying to survive and um, making decisions that we might think are irrational, but if you're concerned about surviving a couple of days, a lot of people in Afghanistan cut down their fruit trees and their pistachio orchards to sell for firewood rather than wait for next year when they could harvest the crops because there were a lot of uh, gangs and others who would cut down the trees anyway and <laughs> sell it for charcoal. And so they're just trying to make sure that they get whatever benefit they can out of that. 
And then we see um, in many instances, the breakdown of environmental governance. Um, Liberia, by the end of their civil war, the Forestry Development Authority did not have a single working vehicle. And if they don't have vehicles, they can't go out and inspect. And there was a lot of illegal logging that occurred that way. We also see an inability of capitals to exert rule of law outside of the, the outside of the cities, which is where a lot of the natural resources in these uh, um, conflicts are being uh, exploited. So again, people really focus generally on the intentional targeting, but the impacts of the breakdown of environmental governance can be insidious. And uh, there is really no law that addresses that. And I'll pause there. There's another aspect to the conflict in Ukraine, which I think is very interesting that Carol's going to touch on. Thanks, Carl. Um, and as Carl alluded, many of the impacts of war on the environment are insidious. And I think that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has caused one category of those impacts to come into the light in ways that has been extraordinarily rare in the past. And that is the relationship between war and our shared climate. To a greater degree than, than, than any, any conflict in recent history, this invasion has been fueled, it has been financed by fossil fuels. Um, it has, and it has also seen the use of fossil fuels as an instrument themselves of economic warfare. And so I think one of the, I think one of the really extraordinary facets about Russia's invasion of Ukraine is we've seen the war play out in the climate context to such a degree that not, not only environmental activists, but climate activists have seen this war as a direct threat to the work that we've been doing to address climate change. And at the same time, Russia's weaponization of its oil and gas exports to Europe as a way to keep Europe and, and, and you know, potentially other countries from intervening in the crisis to support Ukraine has actually led to, you know, created the opportunity to accelerate Europe's transition away from Russian oil and gas to other sources of energy and potentially if this if the opportunity were seized to shift and accelerate its its, its reliance away from oil and gas and to more renewable energy resources and to greater energy efficiency i think i, I mentioned this because while russia used fossil fuels as a as a weapon of 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 war um that has in pretty fundamental ways backfired for Russia. Um, but whether, whether that backfiring for Russia actually, actually ultimately benefits our, our work on the climate or harms it because, because the EU and, Euro and the US race to install new fossil fuel facilities simply in other places remains to be seen. Um, and I think with that, I'll turn it back to Carl who will walk us through the, the legal dimensions of these environmental impacts. So for as long as we have seen excessive damage to the environment from conflict, we have seen efforts to try to rein that in. You go back to uh, the Old Testament. Deuteronomy provides that the uh, the trees of the field are not your enemy, that you should besiege them. They all, it also provides that um, pillage is, when it is for, to support the war, it's okay. When it is for your personal gain, it is prohibited. So it, this, the idea of trying to control the impacts, trying to prevent the impacts, goes way back. Most solid body of law, international law on this though, comes following the 19, following the Vietnam War. And in the, there were negotiations for three treaties 
They came in part out of the Vietnam War and in part out of the uh, Wars of Liberation. These are additional protocol one to the Geneva Convention adopted in 1977, additional protocol two, and the Environmental Modification Convention or NMOD. Additional protocol one applies to international armed conflict. And there were provisions in there among other things to pre prevent damage to the environment that is long-term, widespread, and severe. And this is generally in response to the use of Agent Orange. They didn't bother to define what long-term, widespread, and severe are, but there, there were ideas. Um, additional protocol two dealt with conflicts that are non-international. So civil wars, wars of liberation. That did not have the prohibition on long-term widespread and severe damage to the environment, but it did share a couple of provisions, for example, around objects indispensable to survival of civilian populations. And then the Environmental Modification Convention, um, you can argue that that's either the most successful international convention ever or the most useless. Um, it prohibits the use of the environment as a weapon. And this really is in direct response to the US changing weather patterns over Southeast Asia. And I, I, I say it's either the most successful because it hasn't been done since, or the most useless because it hasn't been done since and we haven't needed this convention. But it is on the books and it is in effect. We also have customary international humanitarian law. And I think that's really important here because the, basically there are four principles that come in. One is distinguishing between a civilian object which is protected and a military objective, which is a legitimate target. And the environment is generally understood to be a civilian object that is exempt from targeting. Except, for example, if the rebels go and hide in that forest, in which case it becomes a military objective. Second principle is military necessity, that you need to do it. Third is the principle of proportionality. And fourth is the principle of humanity, that even if it's all these other things are satisfied, it still can't be inhumane. So up through, I would say, 2000, maybe a little after that, widespread belief in public international law was that environmental damage from war was overwhelmingly governed, if not exclusively governed, by international humanitarian law. And these are the, the conventions I just mentioned and the customary international law. There are some additional conventions like the Hague conventions that deal with certain weapons, uh, the landmines convention, all of those kind of go into IHL. Um, starting around 2000, there were st started to be different ways of looking at international law as it relates to this. And uh, this culminated in the uh, International Law Commission's principles on protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict, which were adopted last year, that integrates international humanitarian law, international criminal law, including the Rome Statute, international environmental law, international trade law, international human rights law. And it's taking a much more integrated view. And I think that that is really exciting because it helps to fill some of the gaps in international law as it relates, for example, to uh, non-international armed conflict. In terms of, and there is one other source, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. That's the UN Charter. Um, in terms of what is covered under international law, uh, one is uh, long-term widespread and severe damage to the environment. This is only for international armed conflicts, at least under IHL, International Humanitarian Law, pursuant to Additional Protocol 1, Articles 35 and 55, and the Rome Statute, Article 8, Sub 2, Sub B, Sub 4. And the Rome Statute, which means that you can actually charge an individual. Additional Protocols 1 have obligations for states. It does not actually create crimes, or it does not actually enable the prosecution of individuals. 
but the Rome Statute does. And in addition to uh, prohibiting the long-term widespread and severe damage to the environment, it required that the damage um, not be excessive in, in proportion to military benefit and that military necessity is a defense. Additional Protocol 1 did not allow for military necessity. And so that has injected the um, uh, possibilities uh, that were not there before. The second category of what's covered are objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population. That's objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population. This is often uh, understood to include water infrastructure and fields. A third uh, area that is covered is pillage. And um, a lot of this is around uh, pillaging of houses and universities and whatever stores. It also includes the looting of natural resources. And we've actually had a case on that, uh, which I'll talk about later. Area are works or installations containing dangerous forces, namely dams, dikes, and nuclear power plants. And the, uh, the the activities around Saporizhia and Chernobyl both arguably violate this provision. Um, and then there is the question of a, a crime of ecocide. I say a question because there is a crime of ecocide on the books for Ukrainian domestic law. I don't know if it's been applied yet, um, but it's not yet a crime under international law. There are a group of people trying to um, inject the crime of ecocide into the Rome Statute, but that has not yet passed. And then finally, there are other crimes that are related to the damage to the environment, but they're separate. So I, an example is uh, genocide where the International Criminal Court charged Omar al-Bashir in Sudan for genocide in Darfur. And part of the evidence of that was the um, poisoning of wells, which could have been charged separately, but they, they chose to focus on the crime of genocide. The final path that I want to mention is uh, acknowledging that some of these standards, like long-term, widespread, and severe, they may be vague, they may be high. There's a way just to kind of bypass that entirely as it, as it applies to Ukraine. In following the 1990-91 Gulf War, where Iraq invaded Kuwait, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 687, which held Iraq liable for all damage resulting from the illegal aggression, from the invasion of Kuwait, which violated Article 2, Paragraph 4. And Colin Powell, who was then Secretary of State, referred to this as the Pottery Barn Doctrine. You break it, you buy it. We're not worrying about standards of reasonable care and uh, is there a defense of military necessity or any of that. It's just this was an illegal war, and therefore all the damage that flowed out of that war is incurred by the aggressor. And so that there, there's a very interesting uh, parallel with the invasion of Ukraine. Um, there are challenges, which we'll talk about in a bit, about how do you actually hold Russia and Russians accountable? Um, they're a permanent member of the Security Council. There's no way a resolution like that would go through the Security Council now. Um, and then, th so th those are the, um, uh, those are the different bodies of law. Carol, I don't know if you want to jump in on any of that. No, I think we're, I think we're, we're, we're set, uh, you know, I think so much of this continues when we talk about some of those precedents um, and the, and the, and the compensation commission, which we'll turn to next. I do, but I do want to lift up something very fundamental that true, that, that, that Carl just pointed out. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is 
in clear violation of international law. It is an illegal war. And in those contexts, in, in, those, in those circumstances where this is actually an illegal international war, um, law, the law becomes quite different in, in part in the way that, that Carl alluded, which is that many of the justifications that would apply in a so-called just war or a war where there was some uncertainty as to the ill as to the legality of of of, of the actions of, of of the various parties are not going to apply here um, because there is no circumstance in which military judgments can be considered legitimate and reasonable against the backdrop of of a military invasion that itself is illegal. I think it's going to raise really fundamental, really fundamental questions. And you know, as as experience has shown, and Carl alluded to this, and we'll talk about it just a more, just a bit more in a moment. But the law has proven that confronted with stark new realities, confronted with the urgent necessity of evolving it can and will evolve. And I think we are likely to see that um, in, in the wake of, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and so back over to you, Carl. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about different options for holding Russia and Russians accountable for environmental damage under international law. And there are a number of legal precedents. These are... Um, <laughs> Very good question. We'll have fun with that one in a moment. Um, uh, the um, but uh, well, th there are a number of legal precedents, but they're relatively modest. Uh, so this is, I would say, that there's enough there that it's clear that this is not just an idea, but it's not the sort of thing where we have a long body of case law on all these different issues. There's a case here and a case there and a case there. Um, the first I will note is with the International Court of Justice. And the most promising or the most relevant case that was concluded was between Uganda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And this relates to the war in Eastern DRC where Uganda had sent in troops, um, Rwanda had sent in troops, Angola had sent in troops. There, there was a lot of different uh, countries that had been involved, but DRC filed suit against Uganda and Rwanda in the International Court of Justice. Rwanda said, we do not recognize the compulsory jurisdiction. Bye-bye. And so the case was dismissed. Rwanda, or Uganda had recognized the compulsory jurisdiction, and they counterclaimed. Uh, as a response, saying that DRC had uh, allowed or orchestrated the destruction of their embassy in Kinshasa. Um, and uh, there were two rounds of decisions by the International Court of Justice. In 2005, the ICJ held that Uganda was liable for the pillage of natural resources in eastern DRC. And DRC was liable for the destruction of the embassy. And the countries should go and negotiate the amounts of the damages. But they remain of the matter. That is to say that after more than a decade of failing to agree on an amount, it went back to the ICJ. And in, on the 9th of February, 2022, 15 days before Russia invaded, the ICJ issued its decision and it awarded damages, uh, it awarded amounts. So this was based primarily on recommendations of a panel of four legal jurists who had tried to set an amount. This included $225 million for damages to persons, $40 million for damage to property, and $60 million for damage to natural resources. And the court decided that the total amount should be paid in five annual installments of $65 million. 
This is the first, and to my knowledge, the only case by the International Court of Justice where they awarded damages for wartime harm to the environment. There was an earlier effort by the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, which subsequently became Serbia and Montenegro, to file a case against the 10 NATO countries. This is the case concerning the legality of the use of force. That case was dismissed, though, because the NATO countries did not recognize the compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ. One of the weaknesses of the ICJ, it has a lot of credibility, but it has very limited power to compel parties to appear. One of the exceptions, genocide. And so it, it did issue a, um, a very rapid decision regarding the invasion of Ukraine because there have been claims of genocide uh, in that. Um, but it, the, uh, the ICJ is a general matter, especially when it comes to environmental damage, does not have compulsory jurisdiction for most of the countries, including Russia. Then we shift to criminal tribunals. And I think it's interesting, the, the, the first real place where we see international criminal law coming to bear is following World War II. And um, the Nuremberg Tribunal, which uh, tried um, the high level Nazi officials, convicted Alfred Yodel of scorched earth tactics because they were deemed to be punitive. But they acquitted General Lothar Rendelich, who uh, believed that the scorched earth tactics were a military necessity. So this is one of those things where it, you know, the, the old customary principle of necessity plays out that if it's necessary, it's allowed. If it's punitive, it's not allowed. Um, the special court, uh, I should also note that the Japan Tribunal also got involved, not so much on scorched earth tactics, but more on the exploitation of opium uh, uh, um, during World War II. The special court for Sierra Leone had a few cases um, that touched on diamonds and uh, diamonds as conflict resources, the RUF case and uh, the um, indictment of Charles Taylor, but ultimately these generally focused on other crimes like slavery associated with the extraction of illegal diamonds. Um, the International Criminal Tribunal uh, for former Yugoslavia um, had uh, at least one uh, officer, uh, Tehofil Vlaskic, who was an officer in the Croatian Defense Council, uh, sentenced to prison for uh, nine years in prison um, for the uh, systematic and wanton destruction of livestock, among other things. Um, the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction uh, over a number of things, including uh, long-term widespread and severe damage to the environment. They have looked at some of the environmental harms, but they have yet to charge someone specifically for environmental damage uh, that violates international law. The indictment of Omar Bashir was for genocide that included the um, poisoning of wells. Um, but the ICC has expressed in the last decade a real interest and commitment to environmental issues because there's a perception that the ICC has kind of pushed that off to the side for what they had deemed more important issues like genocide. And so they're starting to see that the environment is intimately connected to the conflict, to the narrative of conflict, to the economy of conflict. And they're starting to look at that in a more strategic way. We see a number of domestic courts trying and convicting individuals for, uh, usually it's for trade in conflict resources. Um, uh, European Union uh, convicted Leonid Minin uh, uh, for trading in uh, um, timber in Liberia. Minin, uh, for those who are interested, was one of two individuals, including Victor Bout, who was the model for Nicolas Cage's uh, in The Lord of War. Um, so he 
played quite a few uh, uh, um, uh, unsavory roles in the Liberia conflict. Netherlands convicted Hus Calvinhoven, uh, I think it was 17 years. Belgium uh, prosecuted Sambiri Osaili and Aziz Nasur. France had a, DH, a DLH case for Liberia. Belgian case was for Sierra Leone. Switzerland has investigated uh, corporations for um, illegal gold mining in DRC, and I think Sudan. So the domestic courts also have some precedent. The, the last um, precedent, which I think is the most relevant, is the UN Compensation Commission. And as I mentioned, this was create, established by Security Council resolution, and it assumed damages. It was just a question of what were the compensable damages. So for environment, if there was oil damage from before the war, Iraq wasn't liable for that. But all the damage uh, that the oil spills and fires caused as a result of the war, Iraq was liable for that. They were concerned about the perception of victor's justice. And so they took a rather conservative view on what was compensable to the extent that actions had been taken to limit the damage, to cap the wells, to remediate, those were very readily awarded. Um, in the end, they, uh, they provided $5.3 billion in claims for environmental damage, in addition to uh, billions of dollars for loss of oil revenues. But the F4 claims, the, these are the environmental claims, this was substantial. It was about a third of the damages, all damages awarded by the UNCC. It also was about five or six percent of the damages that had been claimed. And a lot of the problems were around evidentiary matters, so proving what had been damaged and the value of that. Um, and I think that evidentiary question is important when you look at the results of the Eritrea Ethiopia Claims Tribunal, where Ethiopia claimed, I think, more than a billion dollars in damage to uh, forests and other land. And the tribunal threw the whole thing out, did not give a single dollar in compensation, largely on evidentiary matters. Um, and I think, Carol, you want to talk a little bit about um, another aspect here. Yeah, I think, you know, and I, I'm, I'm cognizant of where we are on time, and I'm certain that folks want to get to questions. So I, I think wanna, I want to pick up just a few threads here. Um, you know, the UN Compensation Commission, you know, was, I think, is a, is a relevant precedent in this context. Um, at, but as, 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 you know, as, as the question in the, in the chat, uh, you know, alludes, the UN Compensation Commission required the Security Council to adopt a resolution. Um, because, you're, because Russia sits on the Security Council, we're, unlike, we're, we're not going to see something adopted like that. To the question of why was Russia not removed from the UN Security Council, that is because removing, removing Russia from the Security Council would actually require an extraordinary modification of, of the how, how the UN has been established to date. And this is an active matter that, that has been raised again and again in, you know, over the years and with increasing frequency, the question of the structure of the Security Council. For now, we, we should assume that the Security Council is unlikely to change unless this forces a change. Um, but that doesn't mean that accountability is not possible. And, and, and you know, one of the things I want to note is like one of the one of the limitations in the UN UNCC and one of the limitations in previous um, in previous international criminal court context was that there weren't the foundations, there wasn't the baseline data, um, and there wasn't the the certainty that crimes against the environment warren, warranted the sort of serious treatment that I think now there is wide global recognition that they deserve. And, and I, I think in, against that backdrop, it's really important to note that now both the, both the Ukrainian government, the, the, the 
United Nations Environment Program, multiple other states are supporting efforts to assess the environmental baseline data, to assess the environmental consequences of this war in real time, so that those impacts can be tallied and accounted for, because that sort of data is actually critical to holding people accountable. Yeah. So, so against the backdrop of, well, we've, we've, walk, we've walked through a number of the challenges to accountability, what are some of the options? And here, I think it's really important to note that while, while, while Russia could block action within the Security Council, um, that doesn't mean that Russia couldn't be held accountable through other means. And and a particular note, um, high level Russians, ru up to and including Vladimir Putin, you know, can be can be brought to justice for these crimes. Not perhaps in the International Criminal Court because Russia doesn't recognize the jurisdiction, but uh, well, and and even that doesn't, but they could be brought to justice before the courts of Ukraine, before mm -hmm. the courts of Germany, before the courts of France, all of whom have indicated a willingness and an ability to prosecute crimes of this kind. Um, many of the, you know, many of the crimes that we're seeing in the context of this of this conflict are crimes of universal jurisdiction that themselves are going to going to open up accountability in, in, in much broader ways. And you know, I think there's a there's an argument that I am, that, that people often make, well, yes, but the, but Vladimir Putin is in is in Russia and all these people are in Russia and you can't make them leave. No, you can't necessarily make them leave, but life is very long. And not being able to leave Russia for the rest of your life for fear of being arrested, prosecuted, and imprisoned um, is, is a really substantial and increasing risk. So I, I mentioned that because, you know, one of the hardest things to appreciate in contexts like this is that when whether we're talking with students or whether we're talking with reporters, like they want to know, well, what can be done right now? What can be done right now? Like if we can't hold them right accountable right now, then it's not going to happen. But the law doesn't move that way. The law has a very, very long memory, particularly when it comes to international crimes. And that means that that and as I mentioned, the law has the capacity to evolve. So while it may not be immediately apparent how accountability will occur, that is not at all the same thing as saying, Russia and 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 Russian leaders won't be held accountable. And if you want evidence of that, look no further than the recent announcement that that the International Criminal Court has issued an arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin Putin um, on on charges related to the Ukraine war. Now those charges stem from Putin's decision to to basically kidnap, that direct the kidnapping of large numbers of Ukrainian children and 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 deport them from the country into Russia against their will and the will of their parents. Um, but it is a beginning, and it speaks to I think it speaks to the readiness of the international community to hold hold Russia and hold Russian leadership accountable at the highest levels. Um, and this this will be as all all stories stories of legal accountability in the in the wake of war have been. It will be a very long story. Mm -hmm. um, and the the key thing to recognize at this moment is the most important things to be doing are working to end the war and working to build the factual and legal foundations for long term reparations and accountability once the bullets have stopped. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Carl, and then hopefully we can move on to questions. So um, very quickly, um, the the long arc of international accountability, two examples. One, um, Slobodan Milosevic sat very comfortably in Serbia until there was a change in government and pressure for them to turn him over. Um, and Masoud, who was in Libya, 
one of the architects of the bombing of Pan Am 103 over Lockerbie, lived 30 some years, I think, close to that, 27 years in uh, Libya and uh, you know, chaos, changing governments and he gets turned over. So there are, you know, sometimes people are caught when they travel, sometimes their governments tire of them. Um, the other thing which I wanted to highlight is, I don't think that we'll see a, a body created by the Security Council, but there are other options. One is there could be a UN General Assembly resolution. Um, one country, one vote. Um, uh, coming back to why Russia was not removed from the Security Council, well, they're hardwired into the Security Council in Article 23 of the UN Charter. They're one of the five permanent members. I mean, USSR actually is, but Russia is the inheritor of that uh, prerogative. But the UN General Assembly, one, one uh, country, one vote, it, that could happen. I don't know if they will do that because that's starting to blur the lines between the realm of the Security Council on Security and the realm of the General Assembly. But it's possible. The other would be an ad hoc tribunal created by like-minded states. The US has seized or frozen, frozen $100 billion in Russian state assets. That can go a long way to compensating for the damages, not just the environmental damages. You, I understand, has frozen even more. And so there are a growing number of countries in, in the EU, people within the US that are calling for a, um, an accountability mechanism that would not just be criminal, but also monetary. So I think that there, and once you get that set up, the procedures that the UNCC adopted for assessing the scientific impacts of the environmental damage, for valuing the damages, for uh, hearing from different parties, all of that will come to play. Um, so I think the UNCC is a very important prospect. I think I'll close with kind of two quick comments. Um, I'm really excited about this because for years, the UNCC was viewed as an anomaly. It's like, you're not gonna get a rich country that loses, uh, that, will, that, that can pay for the environmental harm. We're seeing that not only are we getting another country, but it may be possible to do it against one of the P5, the five permanent members of the, um, of the Security Council. Second, we're seeing renewed interest in the environmental consequences of war, how to apply it, how to operationalize. And third, which I think is also very interesting, we're seeing growing interest in the linkages between security and sustainable development that for a long time, the peace and security have been viewed as another realm. And we're seeing that that's very integrated. And uh, we saw this uh, um, at the Stockholm Plus 50 international meeting, the 50th anniversary of the, the 1972 Stockholm conference that created the global international environmental movement. And the war in Ukraine, activated a lot of people in ways that would not have been possible to get people talking about this issue. So uh, Carol talked about how um, a number of Putin's actions may have backfired from what he wanted. And I think that was another one where we will see long-term impacts. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. And just to wrap us up um, and go, you know, before we get to questions, I'll, I'll add just one thing to that. Um, and that is, as we, you know, as we, we noted early on, this is, this is a war that is seen, you know, Russia's military bankrolled by sales of oil and gas, sustained by oil and gas, and, and we've seen oil and gas weaponized. But one consequence of that is that it is also highlighted for the wider international community something that that people in the environmental peace building space have known for a very long time which is that fossil fuels have a particularly 
strong link to instability and conflict. And I think one of one of the you know one of the long term consequences of this invasion may be that that link that role of fossil fuels and fossil fuel dependence to instability, insecurity, um, and and conflict is is coming more into the public consciousness at a moment when the world is is ready and urgently needs to be moving off of fossil fuels. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you both very much. This was very interesting and covered a lot of important aspects of this. I appreciate that you do such a good job of linking, you know, human human um, concerns with the environment, with state actions. Everything is so interchangeable. Security for people, the environment, um, the ability to fend for themselves. So thank you very much for that. I also have on my wall, you said, you said Martin Luther King's <laughs> quote about the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And that applies here. So if we have any questions, you can put them in the chat, you can put them in the Q&A. Sometimes it takes people a, a bit of time to get going, but please feel free to do that. I can um, ask a question about um, the ICC and Putin, because if Russia doesn't recognize the jurisdiction of the ICC or is not signed on to it. Um, I mean, it's certainly at some point Putin could be turned over, but is it legitimate if they aren't a party to that for their state leader to be charged? Um, Carl, you want to start and then I'll go. Sure. Um, uh, I think that um, Carol had the magic two words, universal jurisdiction. Um, that when people commit war crimes or crimes against humanity, they are liable under international criminal law. The International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over these crimes. The question of Russian state uh, membership is more a question of whether Russia is obliged to send people to the court. It's not a state party. It's not obliged to send. But the, 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 the rules that it enforces are crimes under international criminal law. Carol? No, that's exactly right. And so I think it's, you know, as, as Carl alludes, you know, Russia isn't, isn't required to send people, but it cannot prevent people from being hauled before the ICC if they come within the ICC's jurisdiction. And the ICC's jurisdiction on these matters on, you know, is not exclusive. Um, states, mm -hmm. other states have long histories of prosecuting war crimes. Um, and that is widely recognized as legitimate. And it's actually encouraged. The ICC is meant as a kind of court of last resort where, they, you know, the, the, the home country can't or won't do it. And other countries have not gotten their hands on them, or they get their hands on the defendant or the accused, but they don't they don't want to try them, so they send them to the ICC. Right. And that's a part of the statute too, that they wanted to go through that that procedure first. I mean, this is, you know, over the big question about great powers versus um other states in the system and the notion that the great powers will never have to um, have to be accountable in this way. But it seems like you've given a lot, us a lot of options where that can indeed happen. Um, because of course, it seems like a lot of, well, the ICC have been people from Africa and dead and so forth. So this is somewhat of a change. Um, so I think maybe I, I shouldn't ask the question in terms of how you counter that, because I think you've been doing it the whole time, but just to emphasize the notion that many people feel it's impossible to do anything when the great powers are collaborating with it. But yeah, I think you've shown that I, there is. <laughs> well, I, I also think there's powerful political motivations for responding to this. This is the first really big war invasion I'm not talking about the dissolution of uh, Yugoslavia, but it's the first land invasion of one country by another 
at the scale since World War II in Europe. And I think not only is the US and Ukraine concerned about it, but a lot of European nations are saying, what if this is the Anschluss 70 years later? What if, or 80 years later, what if you know, Ukraine's the first and then comes Finland, then comes Poland. And it's just kind of, you know, trying to make Russia great again. Um, and so I think there's a strong desire to stop it and to have a strong punishment to deter others from doing this in the future. Right. Yeah. And, and I think what I would add to that is the law is conservative, the law is slow, the law is imperfect, and the law is imperfectly just at best. And mm -hmm. international law is no exception to that. International law is, is deeply, deeply conservative. So change takes a long time. Um, but I think what is also really important to note is that you know the, that pressure for change on this system has has been coming for a long time, and each each of like each incident like this adds to that pressure and pushes us to look for new new ways to resolve intractable problems. Um, and so, you know, will we will we get there quickly? Not necessarily, but ultimately, you know, ultimately the the system will have to change because the the in the face of of such profound inflexibility, it will become increasingly unstable as a system. I think it goes back to the arc of history that uh, you were just talking about. And I, yeah. I do really appreciate the comment by Mia O'Brien, who expressed both. Uh, being distraught and hopeful. I think that's a really appropriate combination. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. It, can we just talk a little bit about um, fossil fuel companies? You know, I'm thinking of BP, you know, getting record profits and then going back on how much they're going to contribute to renewable energy, um, which seems to work against every movement forward. So how do companies play into this and in dealing with them? Oh, that's a lecture for another day. Um, <laughs> so here's here's what I will say. I mean, that is absolutely true. It's also not at all surprising that if you if you look at the history of 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 the major oil and gas producers in this in in this space, you know, commitments to invest in renewable energy have have fluctuated, have come and come and gone, often in response to what appears to be the political pressure of the moment. Um, at the same time, what is also the case is that the Russian invasion and the and the U.S. and European response to the Russian invasion forced all of the carbon majors substantially out of Russia. And this is this is actually extraordinarily important from a climate perspective because Russia's oil and gas industry is very old, and 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 tech and, and technologically very impoverished, like technologically impoverished. And so <clears throat> much of its oil and gas, much much of its major new oil and gas plays were dependent on the technological resources of of U.S. and European oil majors. Um, those companies, in turn, their investments in Russia were largely safe from the sort of public scrutiny, the sort of attention that those investments get in the rest of the world. And they've been forced largely to give that up and very reluctantly. And I think that is actually quite significant. On the, I think one of the, one of the deep challenges to emerge from this is that in the in the lead up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, there was a growing recognition within, within not only international society as reflected by the, you know, the International Energy Agency and, and the UN Secretary and General and others that getting off of fossil fuels was urgently necessary, but also that the long-term prospects for the oil and gas industry were 
were precarious at best. And I think one of the one of the steps backward that we've seen in the wake of the of the Russian invasion is that there have been these massive windfall profits that have made made major oil and gas producers suddenly look like they are sound and safe and profitable investments again. But that is likely to be a temporary phenomenon. And it's likely to be a temporary phenomenon because any business model that is is dependent on war and catastrophe for for the upside to your investments is an inherently risky business model. Um, and I'll, finally I'll say that finally I'll say that you know CL has been actively involved. I've been actively involved for more than a decade um, in building accountability and, and legal accountability for companies of this kind. And, and I'll say that notwithstanding what we've seen in the Russian invasion, notwithstanding the backtracking that you've seen in, in, in BP's claims on an investment, those efforts to hold these companies legally accountable for their contributions to the climate crisis are only accelerating and they're accelerating worldwide. And over the last 18 months, there's been a critical inflection from looking just at the current impacts of the past conduct of the, company, of the companies to legal strategies to hold them accountable for the differences between what they have said about what their plans are and, what, and how their plans are showing up in the real world. Um, and so, like I said, a lecture for another time, but, but you know, do know that the work to hold the fossil fuel industry accountable is also proceeding um, much faster than it may, may appear from the outside. And I just have one other question, hopefully maybe someone else will jump in here, but the whole conflict that you mentioned in the end, like refugees going into areas and requiring fuel, it's a small, you know, cutting down trees and affecting the environment where they are. It's a um, on a smaller scale, but this whole conflict between what's rational for the individual can be irrational for society as a whole. And it requires, I think, some forward thinking and not being so myopic and and do you believe that um, that could be overcome and that um, we are doing a little bit better and just seeing long-term and not just how we benefit us? We are seeing it in a number of ways. I think that to be perfectly frank, this is the chronic challenge in environmental law. It tends to be very responsive. If you have a problem, you adopt a law, you try to implement it. People forget about the problem. They get grumpy about all the compliance. You know, the, so I, I think that there is there is kind of this ever-present need to remember why we have these laws. Um, I do think that some of this, uh, going, going to some of the things that Carol was saying about the European response to the war and the uh, and trying to using the invasion and Russia's leverage over the EU with both oil and gas uh, to accelerate the transition. This is a one-way thing, at least with regards to Europe. They're not going back to Russian gas. They may continue to use it for a bit, but you know there is a strong desire to have that independence and not be dependent on them. Right. So some of these things, I think, I think there's some very distinct areas where they say, "Gee, that was really uncomfortable," <laughs> and <laughs> trying to prevent that again. Go ahead, Carol. Yeah, and one of the things that I would, I would, I would add two points. Yes, there is the. You know, when people are working to meet their urgent human needs, um, that is that is what they will focus on, and and we see this in 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 conflict displaced and other other displaced people again and again. So that is that is you know because they were they're working to meet the needs of the moment as they must. But in those circumstances, I think there's a deeper truth that emerges, which is humans will be humans 
And our responsibility is less to try and focus on 8 billion individual behaviors than on transforming the systems in which those behaviors take place. And, and I think that is just really fundamentally important because when we change the, the, when we change the system, we basically change the options that everybody has and how easy those options are to access. I mentioned this in this context because I'm also, I spent the last six years as a member of the steering committee and more recently the drafting group for the Maastricht principles on the rights of future generations. Um, and the, those principles are, you know, have, have recently been, fi been finalized. We're, we're, we're getting ready to roll them out. But I mentioned this because as we are rolling out the Maastricht principles on the rights of future generations, we have the UN Secretary General proposing that we reform the UN Trusteeship Council to shift its, its outdated mandate into a new mandate as a trustee for future generations and the Earth's shared resources. Um, we are seeing, you know, and th this, this is important because I think the law is beginning to change as well, and it changes very slowly. But one of the deep ironies is that before our current Westphalian system, most systems of law were really based on, on much more holistic approaches to dealing with problems and, and to problem solving. And I think this is one of the things that, that we will see re-emerging in the law over the years to come is is a recognition that, that um, approaches to law as reflected in, in indigenous laws, in indigenous cosmologies, um, have a fundamental truth to them that needs to be reflected in the legal systems that we're creating for our own future. Um, when, you know, and when the, when the um, Rights of future generations are, are ready to be rolled out publicly. I'll, 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 I'll send you a copy so you can share, share them with, the, with your students. But I'll, I'll say here that they weren't a casual enterprise. It was six years of research by leading human rights and international legal experts from around the world. And it was designed to crystallize basically the principles of the law as they exist or should exist from the laws that we already have. And, and so, yeah, so there are, there are paths through this. Um, it just requires changing a system and changing a system is, is slow work. Certainly, yes. Well, thank you very much. I could ask you a question about China, but I, that may be a whole nother session either. I don't know if you wanna get into that and the role um, they're playing in this. So um, if no one has any other questions, and if um, you have nothing else, did you want to close with anything? Are you all set here? I, I think I'm I'm all set. This has been a this has been a pleasure. Well, well, thank you very much. You know, it's been a pleasure and an honor for us to have you here. And it's a lot to think about. And like Mia said, encouraging but depressing at the same time. So other way around, other way around. It's depressing, yeah. <laughs> but encouraging. And encouraging. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's important to end on that positive note with the understanding that you need the arc of history. It takes time sometimes for these things to happen. Some, some things happen very quickly, but a lot of it, and especially the implementation, that takes longer. And I think that with diligence, we will get there or we will get close enough for rough justice. And I think that the other question is, and can we help to prevent other future conflicts if we act right now. Okay, well, thank you both very much. Really appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with us today and for the work you're doing um, on the environment through environmental law and international law. So thank you for that as well. So thank you very much, everyone.